Yes, you lovely people. If you're not already, make sure you give us a follow over on Spotify. And it was saying that, you know, if you get told you're in this phase, you haven't got long left. <laughs> Hello everybody, this is the Foscast. Today we are joined by somebody who I think is a little bit of a legend, an MBE, a little former, bit, a, a, a little legend. bit of a legend. He is a big legend to be fair. <laughs> an MBE, a former professional footballer, made what, 462 appearances, nine for England and a leukemia survivor. Jeff Thomas, how are you, mate? I'm very good, thanks. Thanks for coming on, mate. Cheers, yeah, buddy. Nice to, nice to see you. Right, we're going to get straight into the nitty gritty stuff, all right? So I'm going to give you a date now, right? And I uh-huh. want you to tell me why it's such a significant date. The date is the 4th of July, 2003. Tell me exactly why this is such an important date. Well, it's a date that anytime it's mentioned, I'm back there. It's a, the day I got told I had leukemia. Wow. And it, a day I was told I probably got only three months to live so it's uh <laughs> how old were you at this point how old are you? i was 37 i mean now i'm 38 that's a year i'm a year older yeah. than when you were told yeah no wow. it was um i just stopped playing football months before fit i've gone into business I, and I, I was putting all these little issues that i was having night sweats and losing weight bizarrely even though i stopped training so i just I was ignoring all that and yeah, eventually, uh, Julie, my wife, said, "You know, there's something going on. So let's make you a, an appointment at the doctor's." I went there. How how long had those symptoms been going on, by the way? Weeks, months, maybe. Really? Yeah, yeah. In typical man style, just kind of like yeah. turn a blind eye to it. It's fine. I was putting it down to stress of having a new job and yeah. I'd invested into a business that yeah. I, I was learning about, and I was going off traveling to foreign climbs, buying a kit for the shop and things like that. And I was just putting it down to stress. And, but yeah, there was something more to it. Uh, I was, I, I had a lump in my stomach that I was pressing. It felt like a sponge and it apparently was my spleen had engorged to about eight times the size it should have been. Wow. But yeah, and went to see Dr. Taylor, Frank Taylor, never seen him before in my life. And um, walked in there, he felt my stomach and I could tell straight away he, he thought something. He said, let's do a blood test. Where are we talking? Sort of like right in just the... Just by my rib cage. What, just like a soft sort of lump, basically? Yeah, it was just, I was literally the night before, I had my sister down as well. She was going on to Cornwall, so I was halfway down for her to on the way. So she was stopping over and I was just feeling this and she was a nurse. And I just said, I've jokingly said, oh, it's something I've... Because I knew I had a doctor's appointment tomorrow. This is something the doctor's going to feel tomorrow and say it's serious. But that was just like... What are you thinking? Like a hernia or something, maybe? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Nothing more than that. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, he said, let's do a blood test and I'll be in touch. Normally it takes about three weeks to get the test back. Three, four hours later, I've got the phone call. I mean, I've spoke to many people since then that have gone through similar and it's, it's all the same. You know, that moment of being told is it stops you in your tracks. And did they say to you, you've got well, a few months to live? No, well, they did a, a few hours after, you know, when I meant, uh, went to see another doctor called Shafiq, who was a blood uh, cancer specialist, uh, Dr. Shafiq. And he was the one that looked at my blood counts and said your white blood cells have been accelerated, but they're, they're not doing you any good. Because white blood cells are normally there for your immune yeah, system. They're the fighters, aren't they? Yeah, and but they were being churned out, and they were they were only they were mutating, and they weren't they, they weren't doing me any good. So yeah. they were they were starving me blood of oxygen. So this is why I was finding myself out of breath. I was having night sweats and things like this. And yeah, it was it, it was a day that yeah, like you say that that day just sticks there and it, Scary. it brings all yeah it brings all. The you had children back. at this point, didn't you, Jeff? Yeah, they were ten and seven, Madison and Georgia, and that's all I thought about. As soon as uh, Doctor uh, Frank Taylor rang me up, and I was actually in between two of the retail shops I had. I was on the the A thirty eight going in between Birmingham and Merry Hill, and I was actually going past a pub where I envisaged my nephew had just started Birmingham University. I you know I, was, I could see him in there. Enjoying a few pints in there, in between uh, lessons, whatever they call them. But <laughs> and 
that was it. That was my mind. And this phone call just stopped all that. And I demanded that Frank told me what, what was wrong. Yeah. He didn't want to tell me over the phone. Rightly so. <laughs> and and the only, my experience, soon as he, he, he's saying, I can't tell you over the phone, you, your you mind know. goes everywhere. Yeah. And you know. Yeah. And and I, my only experience with cancer was my dad. Ten years, to more or less a day, that I, he passed away after six weeks of being told he had cancer. But he used to smoke like a trooper. So uh -huh. in my mind, I could justify, you know, he, he had lung cancer and it had gone into his brain. So he went pretty quickly. But... All I could think of was, was my kids, my wife, and what what's next? And after being told three months, it was a dark place. Was that was, was he was he pretty quick at saying, "Listen, with with stuff like this, the severity of it, how sort of quickly it's progressed, and stuff like that." Yeah, because I've ignored it as well for yeah. such a long time. I'd allowed it to get to this this point, but it, it becomes a big, massive uh, learning period now. You'd like if you're trying to take in all this information. My particular, I was lucky. Mine was a chronic illness, but it was slow. But back in 2003, there wasn't a cure. Yeah. Or there wasn't a way of beating it apart from one opportunity of having a stem cell transplant. Yeah. And this was all explained to me the day after by Professor Charlie Craddock. He was a guy I got um, sent to, and he was a, I didn't know him. didn't know he was a specialist in this field. And... He put me on a machine straight away, and it was like being on a dialysis machine. So was this kind of like a, a trial at this point? Was no, it this still was in the trial phase? or It was something that they, they did to try and bring you back to a, a stage before. Yeah. Where I was seen to be in a, an accelerated stage of this illness. And I'd been on the internet the night before. Oh, and it's no good. It's, it it's no do good. It. Don't do it. And it was saying that, you know, if you get told you in this phase you haven't got long left Oof. so I was reading people's diaries about having a similar illness and it, it just went missing there was there was no good good endings yeah. you know yeah. so I guess that's a different perspective though because you know if you were to be diagnosed and say okay well we've got a 60 40 50 50 70 30 chance of being it but if you talk if you get told you're, you've probably frame. got three months if you've got a time what, frame what that's... was your thought process at that moment I was just shocked to be honest and but like, that's what I say. The next day I met Charlie and he started giving me hope. He said, well, get on this machine, see if we can drag it back to another stage. And then by the end of the day, he, he said, right, we've got you back to that stage and you've got three years. Wow. And that was like, wow. I was, a, a, bizarrely, I felt for the first time in a, a, a good spot. You know, it's like, yeah. I felt like there's something to be positive about. And then it was a, it was a, a, a time of really taking all the information and, that was there and what were my options? And the only option I had of beating this was to find a, a match for a stem cell transplant. Um, but then quickly you got told that the only chance of that is, normally is about 20% chance of that, finding a good enough match. So you're just hoping that you, you're lucky. And I was, I mean, my sister was a good match. Oh um, really, your sister yeah. was a... Yeah, I was, and that's where I'm very fortunate. You know, I've seen, when I was going through the treatment, I was sat next to, people similar illnesses and exactly the same illness and watch them fade away you know it was a young guy mark who was only in his 20s and he had a young family as well younger than me and i just watched him fade away because he couldn't find a match so you know it was it was a brutal time so so once you found the match and you you're on all whatever kind of drugs and all this kind of stuff mm. what do you put it down to the reason that you came back and you beat it what do you think it is? Do you think you've got something inside you? Do you uh, think it's determination? Well, no, it was, it's, to be honest, back then it was luck. Like right. I, I could find a match and then it's down to the skill of the, the doctors and the nurses who were looking after me. And Charlie Craddock, like I say, I didn't know Charlie. Can we give a shout out to Charlie Craddock, by the way? Because Professor Charlie Craddock is he's a legend. one of the, the <laughs> best guys the world has ever seen, isn't it? Literally as simple as that. He's just an absolute legend of a man, isn't he? Yeah. It? I thought he'd had a few drinks the night before when I first met him because he, he was shaking. I Probably. Yeah, yeah. And he was a little bit sweaty. <laughs> but uh, after a couple of months after getting to know him really well, and you get to know people really well when... Yeah you put your life in their hands and he's, he's become a really, really good mate. Now, he's the he? loveliest man, isn't he? Oh, he's, he's family, yeah. family, yeah. Can I just add, we'll talk about, um, obviously, 
what you then went on to do in remission, recovery and remission. But I'll just add at this point that, that Cure Leukemia, who you do so much for now, that, that you're a patron of the yep. charity, as is Ben as well. Yep. So there's there's a there's a long-standing relationship here. And um, are, you, you st- are you just a patron? Surely you've got to be like what? ambassador patron or something. <laughs> like you're the main man. You're like the pin-up boy. What you're saying is you're not... You're not you no, like, be, I, I, I don't get me wrong. I think Charlie likes being the main man. So oh, yeah, he deserves yeah, it. Yeah, we, yeah, we can yeah, give yeah, it to Charlie, yeah. to be fair. I don't think you can have the egos in the charity like that, can you? So you're all pulling in well, the right direction. To be fair, direction. this guy here does like... Oh, I know. I grand know. tour, grand I cycling know. tours to raise more well, yeah, charity. Charlie does London to Paris, so I think that's what he did. Yeah, he does, yeah, to be fair. I have done. I think I did the London Paris with him few years back kind of thing and like I said how old uh, Charlie what's he's got to be 60 odd hasn't he oh, what is he 60 well, he's pushing 70 yeah Charlie, probably it'd have been 60 odd I bet when I did it with him um, but like I say he's absolute genius of a man like the loveliest man but isn't afraid to get his hands dirty and get down and oh he's brilliant what a guy his enthusiasm for his work is, is what's got you know people in the blood cancer community now have, have, have been given hope with the work that he's doing and people like him yeah. They're working together now. It, back in 2003, there wasn't many options, um, but now there are. You know, yeah. you've got your, my particular illness is now a tablet. Really? You know, there's a, a, a trustee of Cure Leukemia who set up the charity yeah. back in 2000, probably about the same time I was diagnosed. They set up the uh, Cure Leukemia uh, because there wasn't an opportunity of getting clinical trials on the on the even to a starting point. So they proved very quickly if you put a sort of a network in place and they've got Coventry Hospital, they've got Birmingham, they've got Worcester. And they've all, stoked, talking, all talking. All talking. All talking and other. working together. Yeah. And you, they've got a population of patients that they could do trials on. Yeah. And then they very quickly found out they could accelerate trials. And pharmaceutical companies found that, wow, this is a good vehicle to invest into. So they very quickly got £35 million pound worth of free drugs Incredible. into the infrastructure. And then Charlie... It's a bit of a long story, but Charlie then, when I was recovering, started as you know, I was asking him, what can I do to say thank you? And he said, we need to make it national what we're doing yeah. in the Midlands. So I went down and had a meeting with health ministers because I still had profile from football days. I was able bizarre. Well, it was a bit of a story, mate. To be fair, yeah, do you know what I mean? Like, you you were a bit of a. It was a bit of a news thing. A former footballer, only retired months earlier, mm. suddenly diagnosed with yeah. acute myeloid leukemia. And that's how my girls found out. It was like not a bong on news at tennis, yeah, yeah. but on local news, it was like and uh, saying that former international footballer is fighting for his life with cancer. And that's some. I we were trying to shield my ten and seven year old girls, of course, no, yeah. and they were just watching. We we didn't even think. But I mean, seriously, yeah. Well, yeah, but like I say, it's just Charlie's his vision, you know, is something that I've, I've been trying to sort of fulfil and we're, we're getting there. And he selfishly sort of give his, his, his knowledge and shared his, his wealth of knowledge with other people. And he said, we need to do nationally what we're doing in the Midlands. And yeah. that's why I went to health ministers and went to big corporations and got a pat on the back most of the times, but eventually got a bigger a charity, a national charity back in the day to support what he was doing. We had a three year trial and then very quickly leveraged about 250 million pound worth of free drugs into the UK system. So that was that was a great starting point. And that I felt I'd, I'd done my bit in yeah. the charity side then. So what we, what you're saying, you're willing to sort of like, cheers guys, I, I right, I'll see you later now, right? I was thinking, right, I, I need to probably concentrate on myself and the family again because yeah. I was selfishly doing crazy things to, to raise money and awareness. Go on, and like. All that sort of, uh, I got on, yeah, when I was told I was in remission two years after, or a year and a half, year and a half after my transplant, um, I decided to, to do a challenge which was going to grab people's attention. And I had a good friend who was following my story as a journalist, Neil Ashton. And yeah, I know Neil. Big yeah. bike rider, Neil. He's a little animal <laughs> yeah. as well. He's like a mountain goat, he is. Yeah, he's a good, very good cyclist. Yeah. Very good cyclist. And it was his idea of doing the Tour de France because he followed my story. And he, one of my positives when I was diagnosed was reading Lance Armstrong's book. Yeah. You know, he obviously turned out to, he was winning... Well, I think we can all see in the, the world mentality of, of it, though. The I think is what you're talking was, about. Yeah, the, 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 the cycling world was a different world from what it is today. Yeah. 
and but <clears throat> the mentality side of what he he fought to get back to, How he did to it, win yeah. the tour was what put me on a, a positive and he was raising millions of dollars for a foundation in America and I wanted to replicate that as much as I could in the UK. Yeah. So he, he was one of the things and that was the idea of doing the Tour de France back in 2005. I was told I was going into remission the end of January and we decided to do that challenge in the end of February. I got a bike in in April. So you've only first started riding a bike in April yeah. 2005 and how many months later was it that you're doing Crazy. a Grand Tour? I found myself in July. What is it, 24 stages? 21. 20, 21, 21 stages. stages. Yeah, it's nearly two and a half thousand miles. <laughs> oh, mate. So, so this is the week the, So this is the week before the, the professionals ride it? Well, back in 2005, we did it two days before yeah. the professionals. So we were... Every going, stage. Every stage. And oh. we're going up mountains with... The fans were already there and it was a great lift. Yeah. Um, but it was a great, you know, motivation to get to the top of every single mountain because a lot of people in the world of cycling, the media uh, were saying that you're going to have to walk, you know, you're a footballer and this, that and the other. And I, I just, and there was one guy who said, you need to respect the tour. Don't just sort of walk up it and, you know, just get off the bike and get in the car. And I said, I'm not going to do that. And I, I just sort of, like I say, I just recovered from this battle with cancer. I'd gone from 15 stone. I, I, Charlie said, put weight on before you have the transplant. Oh, I, okay. He told me purposely, put weight on before yeah. the transplant. Cool. I'd love to see a picture of a 15 uh, stone Jeff I was, Thomas. I was a chunk. I'm, sure. I'm what, 14, 14, and 14, late 14 stone? Yeah. I would love to see you as no, 15 I was, I was, stone. Yeah. Mr. Blobby, I was, yeah. <laughs> I know, but I came down to 11 stone in a matter of six weeks. Is that because like, of the chemo and all yeah, that kind of stuff makes you feel that bad? It? Yeah. Can, do you mind talking about the chemo, how that made you, made you feel? Kind of, well, is well, it as bad first, as what people say? Yeah, well, it, it, uh, the initial start of it was um, I had to inject myself with a, a drug called interferon, which is a, a form of chemotherapy. And, and doing that twice a day used to just make you feel sick. So I had to do that for the first initial probably two months of when I was diagnosed uh, to help me get back into the place to get in a position for the transplant. And then I had a period where I found out my sister was a good match. So Charlie said, right, it's time to get clear your body of all the toxins that we've put into you over the last couple of months. And bizarrely, then those next couple of months waiting to have my transplant, looking back on all my life was the best period of my life really? ever. Why? Because me and Julie had made a bucket list to take Stuff the kids. Stuff of things to do. Disney World, nice. go away for Christmas. We went to Mauritius for Christmas. We had three weeks for so Christmas and New Year. And being a footballer before, never been away at never. Christmas. Never, I know. And just being able to do things like that. And with the girls we did, we went down to Cornwall, never been to Cornwall. Walking onto a beach in in middle of October where nobody else is there and watching the girls run on the sun was something you, you don't forget these things. Yeah. And yeah, it was just a magical time. But I knew in the back of my mind, I'm going to have the transplant in January 2004 and knowing that Charlie was saying that it, this might not work. And so you've got that in the back of the mind. But that period then was, was pretty special. Did, did it change? Obviously it's life changing clearly, but... Did you at any point since, have you kind of fell back into not appreciating things or did it change your perspective forever? Uh, it, it did forever. Yeah. Uh, but you do, normal life takes over sometimes and you get down on yourself, obviously when things aren't going right, but then you realise it's not that important really. You know, the, things aren't that important in the grand scheme of things. A little it, trivial things. And what you thought were really important and we're talking mainly financial. When yeah. you when you're a kid and all that, like, you want to have your bigger car, you want a bigger house. Especially in the world of football, there's so so much competition. You know, not you just want to get a place in the football team for one. Yeah. And then you know you do find yourself like you you get on this treadmill of like right, you earn this much, you should be getting this. And, yeah, striving and, for stuff. Yeah. Striving for yeah. stuff, and it, the, the world of football has gone to a different, you know, a different level to what it was when I was playing, but we still had that sort of, you were expected to do this, expected that. So you get into that mindset 
And so, but when something happens like this, it just totally changes everything. You start appreciating the such trivial things, you know, <laughs> like insignificant things, like even just going out for a walk and walking the dogs, being able to do that and, yeah. and looking at things. I used to look at people and say, I actually look at trees now. Or really? I actually look at leaves growing on trees. I was growing, I had this period from like when I was training for the tour in 2005. I was enjoying looking around. I never used to see anything. Yeah. And he said, it just, it just does open You mean your on eyes. the bike? You mean you like to look around and see yeah, stuff? You just, yeah. You, but even just seeing things in, in what this, this world gives you naturally in mother nature. Mm. I never used to appreciate that. But now, even now, I, I, I just look and listen to the birds sing and all that. Have you stuff. written a book up before, Jeff, by the way? I've, have, uh, have you done a book? I have done a book, yeah. sh- that I was gonna, This is like words for life. This is the no, sort of I stuff don't. that people need to hear. And like this is how people should be living their life, isn't but it? Do you remember when Steve Jobs, this is obviously Apple, very famous, wasn't it? And like he, uh, it was his deathbed. And he was saying, like, you know, it's not the cars. And it's, it's people. It's experiences. Yeah. And like you said, doing that bucket list with your family yeah that's they're the moments that's what life's around. about that's what and, it's and about uh, my life now is more is my family really yeah and they come first with everything now and you know if i can help them still that that's my main priority and just being able to just enjoy things because you need to experience things with other people to really enjoy it yeah because to share that adventure whatever it is so it's always something booked now you know, whatever it is, looking something forward to, to look something. Forward to yeah. Something, yeah. Um, can I ask a question? Would what? you ever change a thing? Would you change it? Would you change it so you never had this? Oh, do you know what I mean? I know what you mean. Because uh, because think, maybe you wouldn't have had the outlook you've got now. There is a fellow patient who went through a similar sort of battle I did, but she went through it when she was in her teens. And what's her name? Brooke. Brooke uh, uh, Evans, Brooke Evans. Brooke Evans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. She's a lovely, lovely girl. Yeah. And she was couldn't get to university to do what she had the idea she wanted to get into business and all that sort of thing. Changed her mindset. She came out of it and now she's working yeah. in the ward. Full on after. nurse now, yeah. yeah. And that's amazing. Yeah. And what she said, she said, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. But I'm glad I went through it really? because it's, it's given me a, a di- totally different outlook and a, a better outlook. And I totally agree with her. So I don't think we can answer that question. It is what it is, isn't it? It is what it is. That's, it, that's it what is life what, is. It you, is. It, and life's an experience, isn't it? And it's good and bad. You, but you, you come out the bad and hopefully you've learned lessons from yeah. it. And you move forward. You look forward. I love it, Jeff. Um, can we just keep talking about the cycling bits again? Because um, you said a minute ago there, you got to respect the tour. You know, you yeah. can't go walking up hills and you can't get off your bike and all that kind of stuff. I remember watching. Um, do you know the one where you? I think it was the the Vuelta. You did the Vuelta one. Wait there and- a second, Ben. Just quickly on that, Jeff did the Vuelta. Um, the Giro and the, and the Tour in the same year, yeah. which I believe less than 100 pros have done that. Yeah. And I know they're racing, but still. Yeah, it's ridiculous. What an achievement. And so I want to talk about this one in particular where I remember, because obviously... Because <laughs> <laughs> obviously I, I follow you on like Twitter, Instagram, all that kind of stuff. So I get to see what you get up to and all that. Um, and I remember this one time in particular, you were out in Spain doing the, the, the Vuelta like two or three days before or whatever it was. And there was one hill in particular where you were like, you, you're staying on the bike and you didn't get off, but it looked impossible almost it was like that it was an absolute it was, it was like uh, a gravelly kind of yeah, like it was 28 route. degrees oh, it was like percent yeah 28 percent yeah 28 for, and that was it was 14 kilometers long and it was averaging 10 to 15 wasn't the angler was it was it yeah, yeah. oh horrible it's 28 percent right at the top and it just it, you know it's the mentality. worst experience on a bike i've ever had Talk to well me. that answers one of my questions <laughs> well, i want to know the mentality of it though because you like the amount of times i saw you at the end of the end of the stage or whatever and they were trying to film you to say like how did the stage go today and you sometimes you just couldn't even talk you couldn't no. you literally couldn't talk you were so exhausted like drained completely empty but then you know that you've got to get up the next day and do another absolute bugger of a stage yeah and that, and and to be honest, the motivation of what I've been through, of what I've, you know, the motivation yeah. that I've, has been all 
the battle with the illness and the people that I've met, they're the ones that keep me going on these things. Yeah. I, I, I always think back to the people that I've lost their battle, yeah. that I've met. There's too many, too many to name. But they're the ones that I think they'd love this opportunity to put themselves through this yeah. pain. And so, you know, we're doing it for them. We, it's almost uh, like a privilege that you can do yeah. it. Isn't it? Oh, it is. And it is. And I think um, it's such an important reason why we're doing it as well. We feel like we're we're always going forward. We we never felt like we're, we're sort of doing it for just for the sake of doing it. Saving it. lives, just literally. Quite, literally. Well, yeah. You know, you feel in some cases that charity, you're putting money in a, a bottomless pit. But with the battle against blood cancer, we feel like we're actually starting to win. And yeah. with the infrastructure we've got put together now, we feel like we're, we're, we can see the end. And it, that's fantastic to say yeah. from 2003, where a lot of people were just looking into the abyss, really. What's, it, you, what's it like? Sorry, Tom, I was just going to say, what's it? Um, so, so when you go f- through remission, what are like the, the checkpoints? Where do you, do you get, to, do you have to go back to the doctor every year, two years? How, how does well, it work? It, it started probably every day uh, at first and then, Every week, yeah. and then every month, and then I, I this sums me up really. I because you've you've got a different immune system in you. I've got my sister's immune system in, in oh, me, okay. and that's what beat the cancer. Or otherwise, I, would, I wouldn't be here. And I was on a tablet called uh, Psychosporin, and it was like a horse tablet. It was massive, and it was hard to swallow anyway. But he's, when you open the, the cellophane, it stunk. So I had to take two of these a day. And I used to see Charlie, like I say, probably by this stage every week. And he said to me, right, we're, we're a couple of months into this now. We'll, we'll start taping you off this uh, drug. I said, oops. I stopped it a couple of like weeks ago. And he said, you bloody fool. But I mean, <laughs> that was my attitude. I thought I'm, I want to get in control of my life as quickly as possible. Yeah. You know, to the, my de- detriment really, because... I've still got issues because I came off that drug. Really? <laughs> I don't, I can't produce tears anymore. No. Because of that reason, because I, I can't produce it, yeah. tears. No. So yeah, you can tell me any sad story and I won't cry. That's I'll, it. I'll pull a face <laughs> and I'll go really red. <laughs> but I'll, uh, no cry. tears coming out. But no. Constantly putting little saline drops in my eyes. Right. But on a bike, bizarrely, I don't, I, it's fine. Didn't dry them out? No. No, bizarre. I don't know why. What a guy. Um, so we, before we move on to the football part, we're going to go and talk about football in a minute, but uh, big shout out to yourself, obviously, uh, Professor Charlie Craddock, Cure Leukemia. We're going to put a link in the description down below. They're just giving page because they are, like I said a minute ago, they are quite literally saving lives. It's that I've, I've, I've done bits and bobs with the, with the charity and first and foremost, the people that work for it are absolutely top class people. Everybody are fully, fully on board with what this charity is trying to do and long may it continue as well. Yeah. So, bunch of top people mate, you got, you've got tour 21 coming up july this year so you've got 25 of you this year well we we, we aim to get 25 every year but we i think we're up to 19 this year yeah we'd like to get to 25 but we've got now the support of aso yes they have been watching us what we've been doing on the bike for a number of years and normally we we always get in touch with them and probably try and not get in the way of the tour itself. Just explain what ASO is. ASO are the ones who actually own the tour and they own other big events. They're a family, a French family, and um, it's a business that runs uh, and puts on the tour. All the big races, don't they? They do Massive, massive events. Yeah, yeah, Dakar Rally and things like that. And Yeah, they're a massive organisation. So we're the first UK charity partner. Wow. And we're hoping that lasts for many years. And we want to build on what we did last year. Tour 21 uh, last year raised over a million pounds, which was amazing. To go into Paris is great. Anyway, finishing such a, a, a you know a challenge, but to know that we've gone past that million pound mark was pretty yeah, special. Can I tell you about the time I did um, ride, um, sorry, the uh, London to Paris ride for Cure Leukemia, where he said that going into Paris is a wonderful feeling. It wasn't when I did it because we got sort of into Paris and you could start to see the Eiffel Tower, all that kind of stuff. And the last, pretty much one of the last bits is you go down the Champs-Élysées and it's on like the cobbles kind of yeah. thing. But 
before we got to that point, I said to the guys, were like, listen, we've got another stop in sort of like like half an hour or something. And I was like, I need a wee though. I'm busting, I'm busting. They were like, we're stopping in half an hour anyway. It's fine. So I was like, all right, I'll hold on, I'll hold on. Got down to the Champs-Élysées and I was like, we stopping? They, no, we're not stopping. We're going all the way through. This and we was going over those cobbles, mate. And like, I'm sure it was coming out and it was going all <laughs> over the bike. It was coming down the f- seat, down the frame. Oh, no. mate, it was horrible. There's no worse feeling trying to hold it in when you're going over cobbles, oh, I think mate. I cuddle you as well. Yeah, I know. Yeah, well. yeah, you probably oh, yeah. did. So I didn't get to really enjoy it, to be fair. But I've got to say, the four days I did was just, phew, it was incredible, mate. Yeah, it's amazing how you can go. Like, you're riding 60, 70 miles a day. Then you get absolutely on it. Like, you're having an absolute session of drink. And then the next day, you're doing 60, 70 miles. And then have an absolute <laughs> session of, dr- of drink. It's incredible, I mate. I can't do what it. What a laugh. But the Tour 21's got a particular challenge for you this year, haven't you? Because um, there's a, n- another significant milestone, but you're missing it this year. Oh, right, you will, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's your... Well, 20- bring the mood down a little bit if you want. Your- no, no, yeah, my good... Yeah, my good lady Julie, who's, who is my rock, really. She'd been there obviously, to a second thing and that. But twenty-five years. Oh, celebrated. she's put her foot down. M- married? No. no, married twenty-five years. And it's uh, uh, day eighteenth of uh, <laughs> July. I'll be on a bike. Oh, so you're so you're doing it instead of that? Yeah. So you put your foot down. <laughs> oh wait, there a second. Well, He's got a good excuse. Yeah, then. to be well, fair. No, well, to be fair, I'd, I'd, well, not to. Uh, really I forgot all about it last year when I agreed to do it I, I, I said last year it was going to be my last one yeah and how old are you now <laughs> <laughs> Wikipedia quickly I know 43 44 yeah, yeah. Well yeah there you go yeah no 57 I'll be love me now Jeff you're looking a million mate oh cheers thank you <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah I, I said last year last one and I was adamant that that was going to be the case. But there was a guy who came up to me and he sponsored one of the days last year. And Mark said, I'm going to do it next year. And I went, oh, great, you'll love it. He said, I'll do it if you do it. Oh. <laughs> and then we started saying, no, no, no. And cut, another long story cut short, we got up 200,000 pounds and we shook hands. So that's... One wow. reason why I'm doing it. Wow. But I lost a really good friend last year in Jeff Hill, who was uh, editor, chief editor of ITN News. And he was a Crystal Palace fan, known him for years, and he helped me out. He was a uh, producer and editor on Satanta. Yeah. I used to Satanta, do, wow, do you remember that? I That's used a to do that, that, yeah. I used to do that uh, Saturday. Did you, football, on the panel kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, Wow. And it wasn't like Sky. We didn't have headphones. All we had was the TV beyond below a, a glass table. So good f- know people, what. just for people at home are wondering what the heck Satanta is. So it was like back in the day, probably what, 15 years ago or something? Yeah. About 15 years ago, this company called Satanta, Satanta Sports it was, um, basically wanted to sort of take over from Sky, didn't they? They wanted to challenge Sky and yeah. start showing games and like doing Soccer Saturday kind of thing. Um, and it lasted for, uh, what, a year or so maybe? And then that was it. It kind of just went bust and that was it, never to be seen again never kind of thing. So seen. you were doing it for Satanta, okay. Okay. Yeah, it was good fun. Yeah. Good fun. And Jeff was like teaching me. And I, I, I did make a cock up with, with one game. It was an England game. And I'd, I'd named somebody. Got it wrong. Got the wrong name and all that <laughs> sort of thing. He said, don't worry, nobody's watching. You know, and I was like, <laughs> well, Jeff happens. sadly passed. He was only in his 50s, early 50s last year. Young family as well. And I actually met him at a Crystal Palace game on the Saturday. The following Monday, he was diagnosed. Wow. And he battled and he was... He just couldn't get well enough to go on a clinical trial. And he was coming on board. He wanted to be a trustee of the charity. And he, he had grand ideas how he was going to help. But sadly passed away last year. So shame. I really want to do a lot in his name. I yeah, want to ride and he'll be at the, in my mind. When I'm so is this is this the it. last one then? Is this the, the final? I'm, I'm not going to say it's the last one ever. Don't. Do you know why? Because I don't want you to, because I, I hope, well, not hopefully, but I should be retiring in the next year or two, three, four. Three, four, five. Uh, and I really want to do one of these with you, Jeff. I do. I don't but know if I'll be able to do it. You've got to do all of it. Though. Oh, of course, for sure. I don't know if I can I'll do it. For you Physically, now. I don't know if I can do it, honestly, because I'm a big bloke. Of course I'm, you will. I'm, I'm oh, not, well, you know, when I first started riding in, back in 2005, I went out with Magnus Backstead. Yeah. And um, for a bit of PR and everything, he was great, lad. Great. He won Paris Roubaix. Yeah. 
big strapping guy I thought he was too big for him but he was telling me about the tour he'd never finished at all really it was huge really to like a just too much for the first couple of weeks where I'd it, imagine some of the hill ones some of the some of the big ones the cut off, yeah, yeah the queen stage if you miss a cut off you're out aren't you well I think as well he was in there for I think it was set up differently back in the day you know the sprint days were normally in the first couple of weeks yeah or the first 10 days yeah. uh, okay and then you got into the mountains and then the mountains came yeah. along yeah so that was some time for him to say goodbye time, then from yeah. there on yeah. yeah yeah he's no longer going to be a help yeah but i would mate honestly i would absolutely i would love to do one of these yeah i was I gonna really say because with, with the charity with cure leukemia i think once you get to the point where you want to hang up the hang up the cleats jeff you need another another footballer to take over on grand Chuck, grand Whoa, tour steady on that sounds like you're volunteering me for something here that does i am well, ideal you're a strong guy on a bike so no, it was, it was, I do, I, honestly mate so that's what I'm saying so give me another three or four years or something so just keep doing it for another three or four years and then you're golden oh, alright I think yeah okay right come on then <laughs> Palette, let's, let's, we, let's talk football let's, come talk on, let's, get football. A bit, let's get a bit of football talk on the go um, your best best known for Crystal Palace because you've played with some big boys at Crystal Palace haven't you you I played was, with uh, some of the big boys yeah, Steve Koppel was I you know, when they look back, I forget. He was only 28 when he took over Crystal Palace. Manager at yeah. 28? Yeah. That's got to be one of the, that's got to be the youngest. I hope I'm correct in saying that. Eddie but Howe was very young, wasn't he? Not 28 young. No, no, but still, wow. But he was well known for being, an, you know, educated football. You yeah. know, he mm. got a degree in engineering. Why, why did he retire early then? Injury, he must have He been. had a bad injury, yeah. knee injury, yeah. And um, so it was his first job. And probably a year into his, his career at Palace, he came and watched me a number of times at crew. And I went down there and it was, went into a dressing room and it was the likes of Ian Wright, Mark Wright, yeah. Andy Gray, midfielder, you know, just some top characters. Some of these guys still help out with the charity, sort of look after you, all that kind of stuff and as that, well. And that's the beauty of football. Yeah. You know, football is, you know, uh, is you, you meet people on and off the pitch and they become friends for life, yeah. you know. And uh, and you when you meet them again, you feel like you're probably about, 20 again I know yeah you know you just want to go out and do the same thing but you can't anyway. <laughs> you're not allowed but you were, you were at Palace for what six six or so years six obviously years, people yeah. know you best for for um, being at Palace I know you've been at Wolves because you're a legend and they're my team <laughs> but um, it was at Palace that you got your uh, England England caps wasn't it there was a number of us it was John Salako as well oh wow Andy yeah Gray got John Salako did the Ride London the uh, yeah, London, London Paris, Paris sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah and it was uh, Nigel Martin yeah first wow. million pound goalkeeper yeah we had a good side we finished third in the what would be the premiership wow you know it was um, and Ian Wright obviously it was and Ian Wright had, has done London Paris of course he has great yeah. on the bike yeah. so doesn't know how to unclink Still, he, he was in on. the bushes every time he's like oh, <laughs> yeah. oh imagine having some footage of Ian Wright falling off the bikes he couldn't clip out in time oh what he did Ian like I say the guys have helped out a number of times when we've done charity and I did probably 2007 we had great success in 2005 we raised a quarter of a million pound I won the Helen Rollinson Award yeah, yeah. BBC and I felt there's so much more I can do with Charlie. So I was asking him all the time what I can do. So we did the tour again in 2007, where I did it with a, a 10 cancer survivors, because I felt like, you know, it's not me, I'm doing it for the people. So I got these guys and righty, and it was a year, it was in London, started in London. Yeah. So there was a stage down to Cambridge. Nice. So righty did that, it was over 100 miles, first time he'd done. Oh, I bet he so he was him, flagging, he? he was flagging. Yeah. So we had to put him in the car <laughs> and with about 20 miles to go. But we didn't know, like you were saying about your, your London Paris experience, he had to pee himself. <laughs> Just, and there's it, nothing wrong with it, Jeff. You there's know. nothing wrong there's with nothing it. There's nothing wrong. But he didn't tell anybody until he got in the car. And it was a cold day, bizarrely. Oh, that's miserable. And he got in the car and Becky was a, doing the support, put the heaters up. <laughs> All of a sudden, steam <laughs> started coming off his pants, and he just stinking, stinking in your everywhere. Yeah, that's it. We've got to, we've got to say this isn't like an unusual thing for cyclists, is it? Like the pros literally do this all the time. Well, they're, they, they they're pretty good at mastering the wing off the bike, aren't they? Yeah, bib, bib pull it to the side, side. boom, have that. Do you pull remember it to the side was it Tom road. Dumoulin? Ah, uh, was was <laughs> oh, that tour? was no. Nah, he had a he had a bad belly, didn't he? he had a bad <laughs> belly, <laughs> yeah. Two, didn't he? On the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hit. What are you going to do? You're on the bike for hundred miles. It's human nature. Go, you got yeah, to go, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. So, what about your England call up then, Jeff? That tell us about. So, you've had nine England caps, which is obviously phenomenal. And and how did you get the call? Was it a call? It was. It was um, just 
Steve Koppel pulled me after training and just said, um, I've had a phone call. Graham Taylor wants you to go out to Turkey. It was a qualifier, European qualifier. And he started me. I was surprised to even, to be honest, I was surprised to be in the squad. Well, first, first time with the squad and then you're getting started straight, straight away. Straight away, yeah. yeah. And then we were winning 1 0 in 45 minutes gone and he, he said you're right you're off and I thought oh, that's it then that's my England for me <laughs> well, what was the first half like did you do you well, must I, have... I, I, I felt I did alright it was me and Davey Platt in midfield and yeah. I thought we dominated the midfield and after the match he said you had the perfect 45 I didn't want you to spoil it I wanted you to wow so that was it that was the start and brilliant played nine games uh, got injured in between so it wasn't nine back-to-back -back games but yeah. in the nine games never lost but never scored which was right so you, hold on let's talk about this for a second okay because there's a clip I've seen many many times right where you said you've never scored but you did have one big chance at one point didn't you again I'm gonna put I'm gonna put the YouTube link down below all right if you want to go and watch it quickly go down there now watch it and then come back to this but <laughs> you need to have a watch of this video because it's disgusting yeah honestly it's <laughs> filthy so you get paid who was it that played you through Gary Lineker Gary Lineker so Gary Lineker is kind of the, the, the it's a bit of a counter attack basically Gary Lineker has got the ball on about the halfway line you've made a run on the outside Played you through, clean as a whistle, one on one with the goalkeeper, and then tell me the rest. Can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's horrible, mate. It's horrible. I, I, I am predominantly left footed. And I always thought my left foot was, you know, I could do anything. How many goals it. did you score in your career, by the way? No, I had a Have good we got time in, in. Oh, 66 goals. I've got it here. 66 oh, goals. That's not bad then, to be fair. No, I, I yeah, you can score, score a few. goal now yeah. and then. But no, I totally duffed it. I, you know, I went for a. a a chip rather than <laughs> a dink so he's drew the goalie out to about the 18 yard box didn't you he came out to about the 18 yard line and you've tried to dink it over him haven't you it's not even got off the floor <laughs> it's not even he's not even got enough energy to really he just crawled over the line to go out for a goal how, how far wide did it go <laughs> did it get for people said it had a corner flag but it didn't but it went out for a throw uh, no it didn't go, no, no it probably, not quite the corner flag I'd like to say it was the 18 yard box sort of line. <laughs> it was, it was about the 18 yard box line. It was horrible. It was, it was yeah. <laughs> hey, mate, you it's played just, No, it's just the way that he came through and he looked so confident, like, <laughs> yeah, have a bit of this goalie. It's against France, by the way. This is against France. France yeah? had not been beaten yeah. for a long time and it was Alan Shearer's debut. I like to talk about the positives of that game. <laughs> Alan Shearer, he scored on his debut, yeah. I thought I got away with it, to be honest. I thought we'd won 2 0 and I thought, uh, they had Cantona and some great yeah, players. Yeah, some big boys. Yeah, who was it in goal then? Who was the France goalie there? Oh, don't ask me about <coughs> going back. He's in. got like a bit of a booth on hair, got a long, long. He's like long hair kind of. Thing. I don't know. Who it was anyway. He'd been you... in, in the goal for France for a long time. <sighs> Not. No, I, wouldn't, big... I don't know. I ain't got a clue. I ain't got a. Yeah, but yeah. I. Yeah. So anyway, mate. Um, no, it's a lovely clip. Honestly, that the... was it. That was the end of my uh, England. <laughs> I, I never spoke to Graham Taylor. He never rang me up to say you dropped. And then next time I saw Graham Taylor, I got just got transferred to uh, Wolves. And a year into my Wolves career, uh, Graham Turner, who bought me, got sacked, and Graham Taylor came in. At Wolves? At Wolves, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and then, yeah, obviously, little uh, knock on the door in the dressing room, somebody asking, can Jeff Thomas come and see Graham Taylor, please? That was it. Yeah, so. So I was injured at the time, I'd done my cruise ship. At um at Wolves yeah. early on in my career there, and yeah met him but yeah we became really good friends. Actually. Lovely guy, isn't he? Yeah, top top guy. And you know when you're an England manager, there's so much pressure on you. Yeah, you, you don't get to see the man. Yeah, you just see him for a couple of hours a day. You know, in that time when you're in in, in England training camp and that. But he had a it just sums him up. Steve Harrison, he had his his, his coach. Do you know Steve Harrison? No, I don't know. The funniest man I've ever met in really? football. Funniest man. The things you can't you can't discuss. Really, it's so near the knuckle all the time. Yeah, but so funny, and and it just summed him up. What sort of he knew what worked. Yeah, what addressing him, how it worked, and what characters, and yeah he was I thought he was doing really well he, after, when he started his England career I think he went about 13, 14, 15 games himself without really getting beat. Wow. and then uh, every, you know everybody remembers him for 
the negative spot. That that's life, isn't it? That's football that's especially yeah. as well, mate. And yeah. then, no, and then, can I just say quickly, lovely guy there, Graham Taylor. I've met him a couple of times, and I can echo what you said there. What Watford legend as well, by the way. Of course. Um, but absolutely lovely bloke. We've, his family still come to the games quite a lot. His wife and um, they're that you know he's held in such high regard at Watford. Yeah, well respected. Yeah, guy. really yeah. good guy. Really good guy. And so the current England gaffer, Mister Gareth Southgate. So you were his skipper at Palace, weren't you? Yeah, he was. Um, and I, th- I think it was about 16, 17 when I first went there. So, yeah, taught him everything I, I knew. <laughs> what was Gareth, what was Gareth like back in the day then? Was he, because I've read, I've read a story about Gareth Southgate. He was like Mr. Professional, basically. Have you right. seen the, yeah, there's a video, isn't yeah. there? Have you seen the videos where they're like, what do you like to do on a Saturday night? And he's like, it's like almost James Milner-ish. Like, <laughs> like I'll have a Ribena and, yeah, and, and a salad. Like Coke, yeah, or it? something like that kind of thing. He, yeah, right from day one, he was like that. Really? You know, he's, he's, he wrote a book with um, Andy Woodman. Yeah, he was goalkeeper. Yeah, goal his, coach, his best yeah. mate at the time, and probably still is. Andy, yeah. great character. Andy was like, he was like chalk and cheese, really. Andy was want, wanting to get on the beer and yeah. get out there after a game. Good lad, he's a goalie though, any good lad. Yeah, yeah, great lad. But Gareth would go out with him, but then he'd be, you know, collar and tie, and nicely done up. Really? And, yeah. I'll t- can I tell you about one night? This sums up Gareth. We've gone out. We've celebrated. We, I think we played Tottenham away, and we've we've come back. And we've gone straight out, straight on a few beers, and we're in a nightclub, and it was called Joe Bananas, this nightclub <laughs> yeah. in, in Croydon. And there was a group of lads that were getting a little bit upset because uh, Andy Woman, good looking guy, was uh, making eye with words. one of the girls and yeah. everything. These guys uh, got a little bit upset about it. It kicked off a little bit. And obviously, everybody was looking at. There was one of. There was a young lad that was in the squad. He'd come over from Canada on trial, and he'd been dragged out by the bouncers. They thought he was one of theirs. Uh, they in their group, and we said, "No, no, not him." So we piled out to drag him back in. And Gareth, he's. Oh, I shouldn't say this. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't actually move. You know, he was collar and tie, didn't move. He just stood against the wall, watching it all go off. Yeah. And that, just he was not getting pe- involved. I don't want to get involved, involved in that. Yeah. He was professional. Yeah. Don't need last. any of that. I don't blame you, Gareth. I'm with you, mate. No, yeah. No. When you see trouble kicking off, mate, take moonwalk back to the wall and place yourself there. <laughs> no, he's a lovely guy. So Top, top guy. When you were like playing with him, did, did, did you... Here's a question for both of you. When you're playing with players, can you see that they... Are going to be a manager? Is there something about oh, a player? You can answer that one because you were talking about the England manager here. So w- was it was it obvious? Yeah, from, from I, I early think on, Gareth was always he was captain. I was captain at Crystal Palace for six years, and he became captain as soon as I left. I think he was probably about twenty three, and he was a natural leader. And yeah, you could see it. Really? He was, he's a bright enough kid right yeah. from then. He was. You could see that he. What kind of a leader? Like uh, as a, as a captain, was he a, was he a, like a talker? Was he quite methodical, like he is as a a manager, or was he kind of would he write you know get the lads going no, shouting? I, I think it was a different era back then as well. You know, everybody was a bit more vocal back then. Yeah, and I think he could take that as well. He he, he you know he 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 was in a dressing room which was a tough dressing room anyway, and you. You had to survive that, you know, yeah. with the likes of Ian Wright and that. Yeah, of course, yeah. And yeah, you for him to survive that and then come out of that and then become captain of the side as well, you know. And he was captain of the side that got Palace back into the Premiership, so he, he had success in doing that. And then he, I think, went to Middlesbrough and yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, became manager up there as well. So yeah, yeah, he, he's a born. Or natural leader. I think he's. I think what what Gareth strikes me as again. I met met the guy a few times. Um, he just he's he's like this new modern wave of manager, isn't he? Where um, it's not about the balling and shouting and screaming at players and trying demanding this and demanding that. It's more of a put an arm around them, speak to them on a on a level playing field, and go. Listen, mate, you're incredible. You are. Can you go and do that? Like just go out there and 
do what comes naturally to you. I think that's what he's mastered with England. Do you know what I mean? He's yeah. he's taken away all the gump. Like he's yeah. he's it's like he's harmonised the country. Yeah. He's brought together the media. He's brought together the the players. Everybody seems to trust each other. And now it's like the national team is once again something that you look forward to watching, isn't it? Like you you like well, it. He went on the media more. side when he finished football for a little bit. Didn't yeah, he, he did, did a yeah. bit on ITV for a while as a pundit. Yeah, and I think he he. he picked up then is so important to have those guys on side yeah so we opened up the players you know the managers before sort of put the players in like closet kept them away from of the course, media yeah. side so they didn't do anything it was always wrong. just yeah. constantly butting horns in though weren't yeah. it I think but, it was what we needed wasn't it I think it was exactly what we needed and credit to the chap because He's ga- he did completely galvanise the nation yeah, and, right and kind of uh, he, he he went in there and I must have analysed and I know Steve Holland's really important to him and and whatnot and they've obviously gone well you know let's bring the players back to the public yeah okay these are all top level professional professionals I'm guessing they don't coach them to within an inch of their life but with previous managers you know Capello even Sven and um it's almost like we just needed someone to come in and, and, and glue the lads yeah, together course, and glue yeah. the nation together. And that's what he seems to be doing. Yeah. But he's, he's, a, he's his own man as well. He doesn't bow to pressure from outside or above him or anything like that. He's, he's very opinionated. Mm. And he'll stand by what he believes. And I think that's his, his success. Yeah, that's good. It's good to yeah. see. There's a lot never, of learning. Never, sorry, I was going to say, another, another guy that helps out with the charity, like actually Gareth Southgate, he does, oh, he does quite massive, a bit yeah. for Cure Leukemia. Yeah. He does a lot. Um, I think it was quite documented when he first took over, he would go and look at other sports and training methods, wasn't he? A little bit, I guess, like Arsene Wenger back back in the day yeah. and looking at I think Gareth was at like NFL we would go to like talk to oh, NFL really? coaches just different, and, and, and just see what because ultimately it's another sporting team isn't it Yeah, and things are sometimes always done a and certain you, way you, I think you feel with Gareth as well he's, he's still willing to learn Yeah, and, and the past managers have got this they feel like they're on this pedestal where it's all about me and all that sort of thing but it, you get that sense with Gareth that he still wants to listen he to players. He speaks so well, though, as well. Yeah, he? he speaks he so blooming well. So what every, every single topic that comes up, whether it's a bit of a scandal thing, a bit of a this or that, he just addresses it in the right way all the yeah. time, doesn't he? Never so, misses a target. What are your thoughts on the World Cup this year, Jeff? Do you think we've got a chance? Always got a chance. I was thinking about the World Cup. It's bloody, It's like nine months away, isn't it? Qatar. This How year? weird is it going to be this oh, year, Jeff? Having a World Cup in blooming December. I know. It's bonkers, isn't it? It's all money, isn't it? It is, mate. I know. It it halfway through the season, though, I don't know how it's going to play out. You could get some weird and wonderful results this it year. Could be you interesting. Could. I think it could nice be interesting. Nice holiday yeah. for you, though. I don't know, mate. To be honest with you, but like say, if I'm still playing, you, it won't really stop. It's. I think we'll probably end up getting, you know, maybe a, a week off or something. But that'd be about it. You reckon? Yeah. It won't. It won't all shut down for a good like month or six weeks or something like that. Yeah, weird one. Anyway, weird. Be interesting to see how the teams manage it because obviously, if you've got players going out to World Cup and certain players, it does honestly. The schedule doesn't change so much. It's um, the, I think the season starts maybe a week earlier, maybe finishes a week later a or something. Later, yeah. But that's it. It doesn't really touch the sides of it. Yeah, they've got a good young side now. Yeah, haven't they? they've got they've some been, great players. Got a chance to be fair. They have got a chance. Right, I've got a load of uh, questions. Quick fire Q and A. You can go as deep into the answer as you want, or you can just give it simple, 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 right. simple. Um, <laughs> favorite cheat meal. <laughs> favorite what? Cheat, cheat meal. meal. Food. If you've got to have some food, like you want a cheat meal, what, what's Jeff? Bag of chips. Them? A bag of chips, like chippy chips. Yeah, I'm all over that. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that, Jeff. No, Northern kid. Um, gravy and curry sauce. Gravy and curry sauce. What's wrong with or, that? Or not gravy mushy and or oh, mushy peas. Yeah, if we're going to, that's going a bit too far. You said no cheap. gravy. You said cheap. Oh, no, no, chip. No, no, I'm, not, I'm not a chip. Cheat meat. Meat meal. Not cheat cheat meal. Cheat. Cheat. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I said cheat. No, no, as in, right, you've done You've done 80 miles on the bike. <laughs> you've got free run to have your guilty pleasure, whatever you want. Oh, what chips are you going for? Cheap, you know, mate. They cost like a fiver now. Yeah, no, they no, don't. I'm <laughs> no, I'm, I've not eaten meat now for five years. Have you not? I've really? I didn't gone know. vegan. I didn't know that. Well, not vegan. Veggie. Yeah. You know, Pescatarian. Oh, okay. I cop out, you know. I, I see fish. Every, I see the fish has got a chance of getting away. So yeah, it's a fair fight. He's got a yeah. fair fight. No, really. so oh, I, I just love curries and things like that. Yeah, <laughs> cakes. 
<laughs> I thought it was cheap, cheap, cheap chips man. and peas. Chips ain't cheap, mate, all right. Um, who were your idols growing up? Colin Bell. Colin Bell, okay. I was, uh, Man City? Yeah, yeah I was City? born right next to Main Road football yeah. pitch ground, uh, literally a stone's throw away. <laughs> Did, didn't they? Used, did they? Was this a joke when I was growing up? Or did they have a stand called the Bell End? Oh, that's what they were going to call one of the stands when they moved, weren't they? Was oh, it? and they didn't. They didn't in the end. I don't think. No. Well, there was, uh, I don't know. Maybe there's a Colin Bell um, room, a, a corporate room now. I think. Right. Got yeah. But yeah, there was. But yeah, can't have Bell End. Can <laughs> um, I've got here biggest <laughs> advice you could give to your younger self. That's a good question, isn't Stand it? Stand next to Gareth Southgate. Really? Just watch him. Just watch him. Watch uh, him operate. Be sensible. I'd, yeah, I enjoyed my time back then. Bloody right. Why wouldn't you? Um, is there anything, you spoke about your bucket list earlier, have you still got anything on that bucket list that you want to do? Loads. Go on. The, the world's, you know, it's a smaller place now and you can get to everywhere. I've not been to South America yet. Yeah. Uh, I hear... Uh, People that come back from there saying it's the best place. So, yeah, I want to get... Travel. Travel. Love it. Um, if you had to do karaoke, what would your oh, go-to... You don't want me to do that. I know, but if you were forced, backed into a corner, you got to sing a song, what song you do? Oh, I, can't even, I, I can't remember any words to a song. <laughs> it's on the all screen, the you're right. <laughs> go well, on, Jack. Can't sing. You can't think, Anything... can't think of any song that no. he actually would want to sing. Probably you two. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. What? Beautiful Sunday, Day? Bloody Sunday. Sunday, oh, Bloody Sunday. Oh, okay. great yeah. song. Okay. Um, favourite film? Oh, I've got loads of favourite films, you know, but everybody goes for Shawshank Redemption, but I can watch that over and over again. Really? Shawshank? God. Yeah. Well, don't get me wrong, it's brilliant, but... Oh, no. Where, where are you going? Oh, it's a comedy. I'd go a pathetic comedy. See, I can't do comedies. I, just, I, I told more, him this. But... I'm more of a serious sort of Nah, I want to feel happy. I want to have a smile on my face. I don't like do feeling remember like... remember when we, we went to the cinema? Do you remember? See, you're not good with any kind of that kind of stuff. We When you were in Manchester, we went to the cinema to watch Seven Pounds with oh, Will Smith. Hell, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's my a gosh. horror, though, that is. Yeah. Like, mm. coming out of the cinema, you know, double date and all that, come, come out of the cinema and everyone's like, yeah, that, that, that wasn't much night. fun. Yeah. Um... Jeff, if you weren't a footballer, what do you think your job would have been? Oh, I was, you know, when I left school, my dad was saying, get a trade. So I was a lift engineer for about two days, found out I didn't like heights. I was a <laughs> painter and decorator, because I, only for about three months, because I knew I had an apprenticeship as an electrician. I was three years into qualifying for electrician when I started playing football. So what age did you turn pro then? 18, 19. Ah, 19. I think that's a good way of doing it. You know, it's very similar to me. It's a good way to do so it. So I became a professional footballer. I had a choice of doing my final year as electrician to be qualified. Uh, so I took a drop in wages to join crew. And the, the reason why I went, because they were going to Benidorm as a pre-season trip. <laughs> I've not been abroad before, so that was a, uh, <laughs> yeah, a tip me over the edge of being a professional you footballer. You take a pay cut just so you can go Benidorm on a free yeah, 95 quid a, a week. Is that what it was when yeah. you first signed pro at 19? Yeah. I was 130 yeah. quid electrician. And 95 at crew? Yeah, it was worth it. Yeah, yeah. but you get to you know, have a chance of living the dream though, yeah, don't exactly. you? exactly. Um, if you could pick anywhere in the world to go on holiday, where are you going? Um, somewhere you've been before I've just I've, we've just been to the Maldives yeah beautiful beautiful isn't it you know I, I'm one of the guys that can lie down and just read a book and yeah. just chill out I don't need to be running about not on my holiday yeah Maldives I'm with you mate it's mine as well to be fair um, what other sport do you think you could have played professionally cricket really decent I had a trials at Lancashire oh so decent then yeah you Left were fast Bowler. bowler yeah. No idea where it's going though. I, I played uh, I played Central Lanks League in Littleborough. Yeah. And they had professionals that come over from West Indies. So we had Joe Garner, uh, Franklin Stevenson, just great names. Garfield Sobers before my time. But you know, just had a great reputation. Do you not do any, any cricket anymore? No, you don't get involved in it. Oh, I'd, I'd love to, but my knees are shot. Yeah, now. I'm with you, mate. I'm with mm. you. When you add your cruise shit and stuff like that, it does it. I've had three cruise it? shits. So. I've had three as well. Oh, yeah. Kidding. still this playing nice. now. I know, yeah, just about yeah. somehow. It's like I've got sticky glue and friggin' sellotape inside mine. Um, what's your biggest phobia? Heights. Is it? 
Spiders, snakes, no? No, no, I'm fine with anything like that. I love this, mate. Um, best moment in your career? Beating Liverpool at Villa Park. FA Cup? Semi-final. Yeah, nice. We've been beaten by Liverpool 9-0 oh, at Anfield not in nice, September. It? It's an experience for sure. Yeah. Ian Wright was walking off the pitch crying. Oh, it's not nice. He was sad he couldn't play in the semi-final. He was injured. He broke his leg a couple of weeks before. Is this the, the one for the final he was telling us about that he, he it, sort of played not it, fit, very fit? He came on. Yeah. He'd only been training for about yeah. three or four weeks. Came on and scored two goals. Yeah. We're 3-2 up against Man United yeah. with seven minutes to go in extra time. I was captain. Manchester boy oh. thinking, going to beat the Reds and Mark Hughes. Oh, if only. If only. If only. Yeah. Bloody yeah. Um, lowest moment in your career. Might have been that. It might have been that. <laughs> Crying on Wembley when I could cry, yeah. When I could cry. When I could cry, yeah. I, just, I remember looking up and watching the lights all flashing, Brian Robson lifting the cup. Oh. Toughest opposition. Like, because you... Like, opponent. Yeah, toughest opponent you played against. I used to love playing against physical tough did you yeah who did you enjoy the battle against then we used to share a ground well we shared a ground with Wimbledon yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember back so in Vinnie day, Jones yeah. and Dennis Wise and all that uh, and Fashion You cool that crazy game and yeah <sighs> we used to have some great games against them good old ding dongs that's when that's back in the day when you could put tackles in and yeah. proper well, you challenges you had a few before you got a warning off the referee yeah you'd yeah, let it ride for yeah, a bit wouldn't it, go, it? Yeah. 10 yeah. minutes before a yellow card at least yeah. best player you played with Oh, I'll die him right. Yeah. Must have money. I know, a lot of people saying Best player it? you played against? Probably the experience of everything was Gaza. Gascoigne when he was playing at Tottenham. You know, just just yeah. being on the same pitch. I mean, we beat them uh, at Tottenham once, but just being on the pitch. They beat us a few times, by the way, as well. But it was so much fun. He loved the game, mm. and he was. I was playing alongside Alan Pardew, and Alan used to wear his shorts were short, weren't yeah. they? Back in my day, but Alan used to roll his up, so he was like super short, super short, and so Gaza was like all over the kickoff, <laughs> rolled him up to a point where his meat and veg were on show. And like that. Come on, Pardew, we're having it today. <laughs> See, this is what the, this is what is missing from modern day football is the, is the characters like that, the people that have a smile on their face all game long. They're just enjoying themselves and going out there and well, doing and, it. And that's why <clears throat> I actually watched a game today, um, Forest against Bristol City, and I was watching. The guys on a, a good runner was at Forest for a couple of years. Yeah. Great club. But they were looking like they're enjoying the football. They yeah. scored a goal and everybody's smiling. I watched too many teams score a goal and I they're know. like, oh. Hey, how many times do Man United do that? They score a goal and it's just like, that's just what I do. And it's, yeah. But it's not really, is it? It's yeah. not. It's not. You score a goal, Should you enjoy the goal. Do you know what I mean? Smile, celebrate, thank the fans, applaud the fans. Come on, let's have it again. But they don't do that. It's like they're too cool to nowadays. Well, that's it. And I think they, they think it's going to last forever as well. I know. That's what I would give advice to. Enjoy every single yeah. minute. Enjoy it properly. Don't, don't, right as well. don't just watch it go by and think now you've got a, Mate, I yeah. still go in every day. I do. Still go in every day. A big smile on my face. And I'm telling the lads, lads, enjoy this, you know. It's the time of your life. This yeah. is right now. You don't know it. Yeah. But it's the time of your life right now. Right now. Wise words. Biggest cycling achievement? Uh Getting to Paris in 2005. Yeah. Which is the hardest of the three tours? We, the tour last year was tough. And they, they made it tougher than normal. There, there was a, a stage that was over 150 miles long. Ugh. It was one of the longest stages for about 30 They need to years. change that. That's ridiculous. 150 miles. Nobody's enjoying that. No, but that, I think the Giro was like... Yeah? Yeah, it was tough. The weather wasn't great in the Giro, was no. it? Let's be honest, the weather I was brutal. can't imagine any of them are going to be easy 21 stages. Nah, but mate, when the weather's against you as well, yeah, yeah, actually also, nailing it down I with mean, rain. You get in the mountains, it's just ridiculous. You had a couple stuff. stages where the snow and the hail and yeah. the ice and the yeah. sleet and the... Oh, it was miserable. Yeah. Miserable. Toughest ever day on a bike? Um, stage 14, 2005, Galibier. Ugh. Yeah, again, it's, it's another day that I can go back to because it was a day where I felt once I got to the top of that mountain, I could do anything. Because uh, I had a film crew from, like, not Eurosport, but something that yeah, was yeah, like yeah. football Monday. Mon Mon yeah, 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 yeah. They were the 
and the, the guys who were riding with me, I had four journalists riding with me. And they said they're only here to watch you fail. And I thought, oh. and I, I, I nearly did, through, to be honest. And I, you know, and I had to, and it was 28 degrees. We're just in lycra tops, lycra bottoms, nothing else. 28 degrees at the bottom. It was three degrees by the time we got to the top. I think, mate, it's obviously like, listen, we're, we're at the end of the pod and that's been absolutely incredible. But you said that I nearly failed, but I think that's the reason why you are what you are and why you've done what you've done. You've frigging beaten leukemia. Like they, everybody rip you off, all that kind of stuff. You've got something in you, mate. You have, you've got this like steely determination, will to win, never give up, all that kind of stuff. And mate, you're a frigging inspiration. <laughs> you are. Thank you. Seriously. I'm not even joking. You're a frigging inspiration. Some of the work you've done, um, rightly so an MBE, a frigging legend of a bloke. I know I'm saying frigging a lot, but it's true, mate. So um, what we do, Jeff, is we say up the Foscast. Up the Foscast. You gotta look in the camera. You gotta look at it and put your arm up and go, ah, well, we all up the Foscast. Yeah. No, I'll do it first then. So like <laughs> Dude, go go into just go into that again. No, that's the beauty of it. We should have rolled with that because people love seeing that. <laughs> we kind can of roll with it. Right. So Jeff, what, what we're gonna do is I'll go first. Yeah, you copy me after I've done it though, all right? So you ready? We look at hey, exactly the same as you then. Exactly the same as me okay. if you can, yeah. So ready? Okay. Up the Foscast. Up the Foscast. Up the Fuzzcast. Hey, well done. Is that it? Brilliant. Brilliant. First time. First time. Brilliant. Thank you, Jeff.